All right, today I'm going to draw a picture of the two salvations of a Christian. I'm going to just give you kind of a little rough sketch drawing here of the two different salvations that will happen in the life of a Christian. And now this isn't going to be high-end art or anything, mind you. Just a quick little sketch here to just kind of illustrate my point of uh, what happens when somebody gets saved, when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. This is a brand new thing for me as far as working with chalk. I'm not real, real familiar with how to do this, so you have to bear with me. It's been many years since I've tried to try to attempt to draw anything. But if you want to turn your Bible to First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verses one through four, that's where you're going to see the gospel defined. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that which, or what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Somebody has to come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a sinner. And until you do, until you come to the Lord as a sinner, understanding that you deserve hell, you're never going to be saved. The Bible says in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, For I am not to come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You need to be in a contrite, broken state. And that's the problem with a lot of people. They don't want to get to this point. They don't want to get to this point of feeling sorry for their sins that they have committed. They say, well, I'm not a bad person. I'm a, I'm a pretty good fellow. I you know, used to go door to door a lot and they'd say, uh, I'm not that bad of a person. You know, I mean, there's, there's some bad people out there. I've never robbed a bank. I've never murdered anybody. I've, I'm, I've done a pretty good job, I think, of being a good person. I, I uh, go to church, you know, and they'll do all these different things. I've been baptized. I was uh, confirmed and and everything, and I, I give to charity, and I, I do a lot of good things, and do some good stuff. Well, that stuff isn't going to get you into heaven. It might seem like it's good stuff to do, but it's not going to get you into heaven. You've got to get to a place where you're broken, and where you understand that you're a sinner. See, kind of a dirty situation, kneeling down and praying. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, For as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God, they are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were, yet, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you as a sinner. You say, well, I'm not a sinner. I'm not a bad person. Then he didn't die for you. It's as simple as that. I'm going to write these scriptures down so you can look these up. Over here, we have the need to get saved. Okay? And so far, we had 1 Corinthians fifteen, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. You see, Bible believers look up the scriptures. I can tell you my opinions, I can tell you my feelings, and you can rely on your feelings and your opinions, but when it comes right down to it, it's about the Bible. What does the Bible say? 
you'll search the scriptures to see if these things are so. Next we had Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 12. After that we had Romans chapter 3 verse 23. To save some time I'm going to just give you the other things from Romans here. Next we had Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. All in the book of Romans here. Going to run out of room if I'm not careful. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember that for later. 6, 23. Finally, in the book of Romans, you have Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? He'll save you. So we have chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Okay. John chapter 3 is the next one we're going to read. John 3. Verse 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus Christ came. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. If you believe that, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you get to this point right here where you can kneel down and pray and call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, then there's no condemnation to you. If you don't believe it and you say, well, I, you know, I'm not sure if Jesus is real or if the Bible has contradictions in it and whatever else, then you're condemned already. And finally, 1 John chapter 5 Chapter 5, verses 10 through 13. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Most people will go through some kind of a church denomination or some kind of a thing that tells them what to do to be saved. They don't rely on the book. This book here, this King James Bible, has been around for over 400 years and has led millions of people to the Lord and guided them correctly in their lives. But the Vatican came out with a bunch of new versions now, over 200 in the last uh, 100 or so years, and they're trying to replace this book, and they can't do it. With all the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the New International Version, and all this other stuff, they can't replace the book, because it's God's book. And if you believe that this is God's book, then you have the record. This is your birth certificate. This tells you how to be saved. You don't have to rely on my words or on being part of my church or some kind of a thing like it. The book, what does the Bible say? That's what this is all about. You see, this sinner right here had to come to the end of himself. And you see, he can't do anything because the scriptures condemn him. You see? So what does he have to do? Well, he has to come to the Lord as a sinner, broken 
and in a contrite spirit. He looks to the cross to be saved. You see? But what happens after he gets saved? I'll draw the other one. See if I can do this. Uh, I'll have to go down a little bit lower. Again, these are just rough sketches. Don't. Uh, this isn't intended for art galleries or something like that. My grandfather was a chalk talk artist for 12 years. Uh, his name was Milton Denlinger. Um, one of my spiritual mentors, Peter Ruckman, was a chalk talk artist. And uh, I had a long ways to go before I could ever reach either of their levels, but uh, I thought I'd give it a try here. Here we have the redeemed Christian, the one who's been saved, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And now he's got a Bible, and as Bible believers are, usually we like the big ones, the big Bibles. <laughs> Bigger text and bigger areas to write notes in the side, you know, margins and things like that. Certainly not nothing wrong with that. We love the Bible. We uh, certainly think highly of the Bible, but we don't worship the Bible like some people try to say that we do. Here you have the Bible. Dressed in the robes of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about that. All right clean my hand off here so what about this you say uh, what's this one about you say over here is salvation you need to get saved over here well I'll take some some green chalk for the peace the passeth understanding that comes when you get saved and this one here you have get saved over here this one here is a different one this one is, you need to save, save yourself. You say, oh, this sounds heretical. Oh, no, work salvation or something like this. Well, it is work salvation for a saved person. Let me explain myself and let me show you the scriptures, what the Bible says about this. All right, let me get this one here. I forgot to put a line underneath my get saved thing here. There we go. Let me explain myself now. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy. Four. Verse 16. Says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You see, you come to the Lord as a sinner over here. You can't clean yourself up. You're not capable of it. You're a sinner. You're wicked. You come to the cross, you see. But when you get saved and the Lord, you're now born again. He changes your life. Now you have something else, another thing, which I'll, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Um, Philippians chapter 2. Now you got to start working to uh, fix up the mess of a life that you have. Excuse me, I'm spelling that wrong. Philippians uh, 
2, verses 12 and 13. This is the first time I've done this too, so, you know, bear with me. I don't exactly practice these things. They just come out as they are. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's going to start working in you, you see. Over here, God can't work in you. You're a sinner. You come to the cross. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. He saves you. You come over here. Now you, he clothes you in his righteousness, imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. His perfect sinless life is given to you in exchange for your rotten mess of a life that you had. And now God starts to tell you what to do. The Bible says that your body is the temple of God. Okay? So that's what we read about there. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's supposed to be a changed life there. And you should work out that salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Well, because the verse over here, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death for saved and lost people. Now, the lost person that messes around with sin, they die and they go to hell. You don't have to worry about that as a Christian after you get saved. But you can be... You can ruin your life. We're going to see that here in just a minute. You can ruin your life as a Christian by messing around with sin. That's why you're supposed to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You're saving yourself, you see. You can't have sin in your life and be messing around with sin, knowingly messing around with sin and things like that. And, of course, I understand everybody's going to sin. Everybody makes mistakes, sure. But there's a purification thing there, sanctification that happens when God saves you. Next, we're going to go to Acts chapter 26. Acts 26, um, verse 19 and 20. The Bible says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Repent and turn to God. Come to Him as a sinner in honesty and sincerity. Humble yourself before the Lord. Repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Next we have 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Another very important one. 7 verses 10 and 11. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. True salvation produces a changed life. And you see, in countries where Christians are persecuted, there has to be an approval process. You don't just accept anybody into your midst and say, oh, you're a Christian? Well, come on in. Praise the Lord. Uh, you don't do that. And in the future, it's going to also be very important. True Bible-believing Christians are going to have to need to approve people. Somebody comes along and says, I'm a Christian. You say, okay, let me ask you some questions. You see? And you look at that person's life and you see, are they doing works meet for repentance? And if the answer is no, they haven't approved themselves. Ephesians chapter 4 4, verse uh, 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. Boy, what a change. Thief, rotten individual, stealing from people. 
too lazy to get a job. He's stealing from people. Changes. And now he's laboring with his hands and giving to people that are in need. What a change. So what's he doing? He's saving himself. Let's just say this guy comes, he gets saved, and he continues as a thief. Well, guess what happens? Eventually, he's going to have a run-in with the law. He's going to go to prison. He's going to have something else bad happen to him. You see? No, you're supposed to change when you get saved. That change needs to be there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to have to write this a little bit unique here. First. Corinthians, I'm just going to abbreviate it, abbreviate it. you know what it mean there, means there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28 through 32. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Can a Christian have damnation? Yeah, they can. Well, say then, well, they, they can go to hell then? No, I didn't say that. God can make your life a living hell here on this earth. It's like you're, you've been damned. It's like the Lord says, okay, I can't have anything to do with you right now. You're, you're in sin. You're out of fellowship with me. But let's keep reading. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, it's talking about saved people, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. A Christian can get out of fellowship to the point where the Lord has to punish them very severely, bad, but he's not going to condemn them with the world. He's going to chasten them. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Let me jump down here. I'll have to write down under here 5, verse 24. Galatians 5, 24 says, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Let me show you how it works. This sinner looks to the cross to be saved. But guess what? Guess what happens when you become born again? You don't look to the cross anymore to be saved. Now, you take up your cross daily and you follow Jesus Christ. You crucify the flesh. Now you have the cross. Now you're on the cross with Jesus Christ. And those sins and the wicked things that you've done, in your past, you have to get to a point where you're trying to fight those things. There's a war that happens between the flesh and the spirit. Let me continue here. Finally, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. says here and he said to them all if a man if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me for whosoever will save his life shall lose it but whosoever will lose his life for my sake the same shall save it for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the son of man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels you see, that's the issue. That's the whole issue. You can't have this right here until you get to that. Until you come to the Lord in a broken, contrite, repentant state, kneeling down and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Until you get to this point, you can't have this. But what is it that keeps most people from doing this? And understanding there's going to be some kind of a change here. They don't understand all of this stuff, but they'll understand, hey, I'm going to have to change my life. Let him that stole steal no more. Well, 
How does that work when you have some guy that's a thief? He enjoys stealing. As long as he's getting away with it, most of them aren't going to turn from it. Most of them aren't going to be broken like this. And I've talked to people for years and years and years. I've had a, you know chances to witness to people many times. And uh, I've seen people, uh, tough, rough, tough men, that they don't want to get to this point because they understand what happens afterwards. They understand they're not going to be able to hang around at the bar anymore. They understand they're not going to be able to be a womanizer anymore. Their mouth is going to be cleaned up. They're not going to be using all kinds of profanity and filthy talk and telling dirty jokes and whatever else. Something happens. This is what scares them. You see? But the whole point is there, what we read in conclusion in the book of Luke. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. If you're not willing to get down on your knees as a sinner and not willing to have the Lord tell you what to do after you get saved, you're trying to save your life, and guess what? You're going to lose it. Just a few minutes ago, an ambulance went by. I don't know. could have been just an accident or something, you know, whatever. Or could have been somebody passing into eternity. Happens every day, thousands and thousands of times a day. And you have no guarantee that you're going to live another 10, 20, 30 years. You have no idea when you're going to die. The reason you are here on this earth, people get all philosophical. What's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life to know your creator? It's easy. I can answer that very quickly. To look up at the sky and look and say, God, if you're there, I want to know you. Read the King James Bible. Look up these verses to tell you how to get saved. Okay? And if you're saved, you need to start working at saving yourself. You see, salvation is by God's grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 talks about it. God's grace. See? He, I mean, He sent His Son to die on the cross, a terrible death, to pay for your sins. That's grace. Okay? You don't deserve it. I didn't deserve it when I got saved. But God had grace. And I put my faith in Jesus Christ, His finished work on the cross. That's how you get saved. Grace through faith. Over here, save yourself. That's works. Works meet for repentance. You can't do this and forget about that. That doesn't work. You're not going to be saved by your works. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Okay? you got to come to the Lord as a sinner. Come at the end of yourself. That's what's very important. But what I see a lot of times is I see people that claim that they've had this experience here, and yet there's nothing over here. That doesn't work either. They say, well, I've believed. Yeah, well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about believing in vain. And a lot of people do that. They claim to have had some kind of a conversion experience or whatever else, uh, either in some church building and some place and whatever, which are completely unscriptural, or some kind of guy, high pressure, you know, door to door, soul winning guy or something like this, pressured him into praying some kind of a prayer. And they say, well, I, I, I have this. Okay, well then where's that? This needs to be there. And I'll grant you, Christians will be at different stages in this sanctification process. I understand that. Again, a lot of people don't think I preach that, but I certainly do. But what kind of a preacher would I be if I didn't preach against sin? You see? You have to take up your cross daily and follow the Lord. There's supposed to be a change that happens there. He owns you. There are a lot of false ministries out there, a lot of false salvation messages. And they want you to believe that uh, salvation is some kind of a life enhancement thing or some, some kind of a neat thing that you just don't dare miss and whatever else. Um, and there's all kinds of deception out there. But when you look at the basics of Scripture and you look at the Scriptures right there, you can see salvation is a very simple process. Are you a sinner? Are you willing to admit to being a sinner before a holy, righteous God? That knows everything about you. He knows your thoughts. He knows all the secrets that you've ever done. 
You're not going to hide from him. Okay? <laughs> Come to him and accept his grace, his gift that he's given through his son, Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him. And then the glorious thing is, he'll change your life. So that thief that is stealing, that's constantly worried about when they hear sirens, is it a police officer? Is it some kind of a thing? Am I going to get caught? You don't have to live in fear anymore. The Lord will save you. He'll change your life. The drunkard that's so sick and tired of this endless cycle that they're in, they just can't get away from the alcohol and they just, as soon as they sober up, they're wanting that bottle again. The sex pervert that just thinks that just one more thrill if I just get with that other partner there, if I just have this, if I, if I just have sex one more time, it just, it just, I enjoy it and everything else, but all of a sudden you start to feel the sicknesses that come on you or just the, the empty, lonely feeling. Do you want some help getting out of that? You want to have a new life? Then that's where you go, right there. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, well, I, I've done some really bad stuff. Whosoever. Well, you don't understand. I mean, I've, I, I really have some whosoever. See how it works. You can go to our main channel page and uh, see more scriptures if you haven't seen enough here. More scriptures that will tell you the plan of salvation according to the King James Bible. You can do it. This channel is not monetized. I don't make one cent. From anybody watching the salvation message or from anybody watching this video, uh, if you're subscribed to this channel, fine. If you don't want to subscribe, then don't waste your time. I don't make a cent. I don't take money from lost people. Okay? The Lord provides my needs. So you can also watch my testimony if you would like to see that, how I came to this point here and what the Lord has done in my life since then. I pray that you'll get this thing sorted out. There's nothing more important in this life than understanding the purpose of why you're here. Understanding that there is a God in heaven and that He created you. And He loved you enough to send His Son to die on the cross to pay for your sins. And He's not, it's not just this here. He also is willing to give you a new life. Will you trust Him today? Or will you just put it off? Your job's more important. Your relationships are more important. The things of this world, the new cars, the movie, the clothing, whatever. Nothing's more important than you getting to know your Creator. A personal relationship with Him. Please do it today.